Um, it's uh, thanks for the invitation, one to the organizers, and two just for having an in, in international conference on this topic is truly inspiring. The talks have been very inspiring, and I'd so, sort of like to um, close with um, how Dr. Wood opened up in terms of considering the whole person. And I thought um, Flores's talk was just brilliant in terms of one. Uh, previously in your program, it's announced that I would be talking about urban planning. I'm not talking about ur urban planning. Thankfully, we just had a brilliant talk about urban planning, but also one very inspiring, as you'll see, very uh, good introduction to what I am going to talk about. So as, as um, um, Dr. Wood mentioned, we take, I used to head up the Innovation Center at Palo Alto Medical Foundation, which is a large uh, multi-specialty group practice in the United States. Um, now I'm at uh, IBM Watson Health but I'm continuing the same journey in a sense. So we did employ the um, human-centered design approach in figuring out what it is we're gonna do, what's the problem to solve, and I'll explain that to you in a little bit. And just like Mayo, we, we used to call our project successful aging. We changed to linkages, meaning link across the ages, link across generations, because we're trying to build, rebuild communities of the kind that Flores just talked about. And my title really is health transformation, not health care. It's that in the U.S. we really have a lot of work to do to just completely turn our system upside down, and that's what we mean by transformation. Fortunately, we're undergoing that right now through the passage of the Affordable Care Act, which is health reform um, uh, law. So let me talk about first rethinking everything, and this has been a good conference in, in caring about that theme. Second, to use ethnography to study what's the real problem to solve and then get to thinking about creating a whole ecosystem from the buildings, the architecture, all the way through how we, as healthcare professionals, I'm, a, I'm an internist, um, relate to what we used to call patients and really like to consider them as people, and how Watson Health could add to that kind, systematize that kind of thinking. So first, um, headed up the Drucker Center, and this was our mission, very much like the Center for in Innovation at Mayo. We even though I'm part of a health care organization delivering care, the way we were disruptive, and this was a disruptive innovation center, was to say, our, we wake up every day worrying about the health of individuals and communities, period. And if we woke up that way, we will create a world that's better, much again like Flores just left us with. Same picture, a little bit different graph. This is the baby boomers which began at the, um, at the end of the war, but do you know how it stopped in, in 1964? The pill. So it began with the end of the war, and it, it ended with the invention of the pill. Now, either look at this as one grand challenge facing the entire globe, or look at it as a tremendous opportunity where you're making small changes can create huge impact, and that's the way we're looking at it. As I said, we started out with ethnography, studying people at the home, and we went to 27 seniors' home and said, what's preventing you from living the life you would like to live? Not how do we take care of you when you're sick, but what's preventing you from living the way you'd like to live? And some of the themes, one of the quotes was, you know the problem with getting older? Is your world dies before you do. It's about the best way I've ever heard it summed up. Your world sort of closes in and we have to switch that because, one, we're all getting older, but two, we don't have the young people to support us. We have to redesign from the building, the cities on up, what we think of with older adults. The second is, as we leave, you know, we're all focused about um, our jobs, our employment, our professions, and as you leave that, as you retire, getting into the next phase, you sort of lose some of your sense of self-worth, and especially in America, I'd say. And as that happens, the corollary is that you're just a burden to everybody, your kids, your families, your, your city, and your country. That's just a downhill spiral. And when we, when people, so we admit people, they may have a heart failure, they may have pneumonia, we discharge them, they say, what do I do next? And at least the American healthcare response is, I don't know, because we weren't taught that medical school. What do you do next? We don't know, just don't know what to do. As a society, we have to have an answer to that, and I think that's the theme of this conference. One of the things we also heard, so we, after our medical ethnographer went to people's homes, we spent a week debriefing her on what, what did she find. And this is a standard Kaplan-Meier survival uh, curve. 
Generally, this is talking about cancer, where stage one, the early cancer, you have this kind of survival, and stage four, you have this kind. But this also describes something that we found in our ethnography with seniors. This is for women, and this is for men. As people have already pooped, uh, pointed out, we, we um, poop out sooner than the women do. But what is the condition that causes, has this survival curve? It's loneliness. It's exactly what Flores said. It's loneliness. Loneliness is the perception of being alone or not supported enough. It doesn't matter how many friends, no counts of the objective measures, it's what does this person perceive as being alone. In a very longitudinal study of, of the U.S. population, um, first of all, it turns out that half of Americans are lonely, 43 percent. It's not because they've lost their spouse already, it's not because they're clinically depressed, it's just a state of uh, societal life in the United States anyway. It may not be that bad in other parts of the world, but it's also not going to be a trivial part either. So if you adjust for the normal things you'd think about, socioeconomic conditions, diabetes, physical ailments, the lonely half of Americans compared to the non-lonely have a 45 percent increased mortality rate at six years and have a 60 percent increased rate of disability. So loneliness kills and maims more than smoking. It's just that in America, at least, we don't reimburse for it. We don't treat it as a health condition. And the other piece, dementia, about twice the rate of people who uh, are non-lonely. It is a health condition. It is a primary health condition, and it's one we have to design around in order to overcome as the planet ages. Tall order wasn't something we were taught in med school. What are you going to do? You have to think very disruptively, and part of the challenge is not so much coming up with new ideas, is to force the old ones out, just to human nature. So this is the way the American uh, health system is built. It's a sick care model. Why? Because we had fee for service. World passed. Fortunately, we are changing that. Uh, you know how we rate in, in outcomes, not so hot. But we build this, and it turns out that 5% of our population spends 50% of the health care dollar. So all of the health systems in America are trying to do this, try to move people up that, that pyramid. So let's look at it a different way. Now, one of the stats that, that the hospitals in, uh, in, uh, in particular are dealing with is it turns out that one in five people we discharge from the hospital come back in 30 days. And so now there's a penalty, a financial penalty for that. So everybody, the whole world or the whole country was preoccupied with how do you prevent people from coming back in 30 days? I think the solution, it's a more disruptive one, is, is depicted in this cartoon, which I know you can't read, so I'll read it to you. So this woman's trying to pick up golf. So she's learning from the golf pro. And she goes, look, let me get this straight. The lower my score, the better off I'm doing, right? That's right, ma'am. Then why hit the ball? So you tell me, if I let somebody in in 30 days back into my hospital, I get penalized. Why admit them in the first place? Why let people get so sick that they have to come to your hospital? Why can't you look upstream? So let's flip this, this pyramid. If 5% spend 50% of the health care dollar, 95% are doing OK. Now, there's a natural tendency, the parts wear out and all, of moving from this direction to this direction. What if we spent all of our money and time and, and attention on narrowing that progression? Why don't we worry about, why don't we try to make 95, 96%? Same math, same number, very different impact on cities, families, individuals. That society's bottom net would be very different if we worried about how do we keep people from becoming ill enough to be, uh, in the first place. This has been pointed out in different ways. The, this is a contribution to outcomes as the way an individual sees it, not the way a healthcare professional sees it. And the United States spends $3 trillion a year on healthcare interventions. We waste, it's estimated, about $750 billion just of waste, things we should not do, uh, which is probably more than GDP in some countries. That's, and that's all we're touching, of all the things that impact an individual's outcome. Social determinants has a factor of 1.5 effectiveness compared to what we do, what we waste our money on. So 
what if we redefined what we mean by aging and redefined a community? It's alluded, been alluded to in many um, talks before. But so we created this linkages ecosystem, and it has four components. I'm going to talk about three of them just to introduce them to you. One, it starts with instead of calling, you know, the, the U.S. is now into patient centered care, I think it should be person centered care, and I'm going to explain in just a minute. If we consider the whole person in front of you, we would look at things a little different. What if we knew how that person in front of you looked at themselves? What if we knew how their family viewed them? What if we knew how their country viewed them? And what if we knew how their community views them? I, one of my favorite, um, Robert Wood Johnson is a, Johnson Foundation is a, a large philanthropic organization in, in the United States. And I was the head of an advisory committee for a project that included this one I'm going to tell you about. This is one of my favorite projects that I saw. This was done at the Stanford's Children's Hospital called Packard Children's Hospital. And what they did, clearly, Children's Hospital, all of their patients are very sick. So the ones they're seeing in ambulatory care have very serious chronic conditions. So one of the, the, the goal here was, here's, here's this paper. Tell me what you would like your doctor to know about you that will affect your health. And here's what this one girl wrote, or one boy. So now, what serious chronic condition does he suffer from? So I know you can't see, so I'll blow it up a little bit. What serious chronic health condition does he have? The point is, you can't tell. The reason is, kids don't define themselves, no matter what health condition they have, as them. I love the idea so much. I gave some adults, I was working in a um, project on type 2 diabetics, people with diabetes. I, I did the same thing. So they were given, you know, these kids were given the paper, pen, and a disposable digital camera. So I did the same thing with the adults. I said, what, what do you want your doctor to know um, that they don't already know? And here's what one person said. So first of all, as you know, if you ask kindergartners, how many of you are, are artists, everyone will raise their hand. Clearly, we've lost the capability just by growing a little bit older. So there was nobody who used the digital camera. I guess they just kept it for themselves. But here's what they said. What would I like the doctor to know? Well, if I do all the right things, could I reverse the diagnosis? This is people with type 2 diabetes. This means that no matter how much we saw them, we missed that opportunity to answer this primary question or didn't do it effectively. Another person said, I'd like to be healthy enough to give my daughter a kidney. She's in kidney failure. That's a personalized health goal. It's not your disease. It's not about the sugar. And one person said, I want to live to 90. None of the people with diabetes wrote a word about the sugar. And what we spend all our time in in the exam room or the hospital is yelling at them about their sugar, just sort of um, front. So what if your doctors and nurses knew more about you? Would you receive more personalized care? So my wife's an ICU nurse, and sometimes, you know, they have tubes all over them, they can't talk. Sometimes the families would bring in pictures of them outside of, outside of the hospital. All of a sudden, they're viewed differently, and they're treated differently. Would they receive different treatment? Um, when I was a resident, I, I had somebody with um, Parkinson's disease that was in the hospital. The difference was that he was a former Wimbledon tennis champion. What does that disease mean to him? What does that condition mean to him? It's completely different. How you view them and how you treat them would be completely different if we only knew. And none of that information is in our, quote, uh, medical record. So what we did is we built a software so that you could, you could answer things like, well, what are the top three things that would change the quality of your life? Or as you retire, what are three things or things that you would like to either share that you do or learn from somebody else? And so what we did with that First of all, we used it just like Amazon to personalize the software for you. The other thing we did is we put that information, if you consented, into your medical record so that your healthcare team could see this as well. So for example, answering simple questions could, could trigger these kinds of notes to your, physician, your healthcare team. One, this person has a transportation barrier. Here are some ways, um, some resources in the community some of which are free that are available to you. 
Why did we um, focus on transportation? One of the ladies that we visited um, told us she missed three appointments with us. Well, people miss appointments. Turns out there were three oncology appointments. So why was that? Um, so first of all, we have a computerized scheduling system. So we knew it, we just didn't know it. The other thing is why did she miss the appointments? Macular degeneration, couldn't drive, cost $75 for a taxi. We could know that. We did know about her macular degeneration. We didn't know that she needed a taxi to get there, but we could, and it obviously affects her health. Same thing, social isolation, just talked about. There are resources, and I'm gonna to talk to you about one we created. So the first week, within the first week of, of releasing this functionality of being able to get it inside the electronic health record system, got this love letter sent from uh, an internist, Doug Tong. I got this information from the senior profile. It actually changed the entire focus of the visit because some issues like depression, loneliness, I hadn't even thought of. Instead of talking about her diabetes, we talked about what she needs to have a better life and a healthier life. So next component, technology. So when people talk about what's the technology that's gonna help you age in place, which is what everybody wants to do, the most common technology people think of and you can't sell a thing without this, is this. It's a little uh, dongle that you have, and then you can push the button and, and somebody will answer because the, it's, it's called, you know, help, I fall and I can't get up. That's a key worry that seniors have. But that's fear-based. And by the way, after you've fallen and broken your hip, your, your, your morbidity, your prospects is completely changed already. So this is too late. What would you rather have? for mom. If you knew that mom got up and cooked oatmeal on the stove at seven o'clock every morning, and if that's what happened, she's okay, you'd wanna know that. Because that's assessing mom's function, not after she's fallen. So we were in Silicon Valley, you know, um, so a lot of startups in the area. So what we did, our approach to this was to have a developer challenge. So we invited lots of developers in and say, my problem to solve, I want an okayness meter. But one of the things we did so, mo so healthcare startups fail at, at, um, at twice the rate of normal startups, and I think it's because they don't understand the complexity of the issue. So I spent a whole morning teaching them about the problem to solve, giving them the benefit of our ethnography. The winning solution, they call themselves Meter Made, comes derived from um, smart meters. And what they said is, hey, if I analyze the signals of electricity use in the home, maybe I could figure out the signatures of high, particularly high wattage devices, like a stove. So the idea then is, can we translate the signals into what's really going on in the home? Can we say, one, did mom wake up, and two, did mom get up? And that's an indication of mom's okay. And then I can call mom in the afternoon when I'm not getting the kids ready, but that's the sort of security, the unobtrusive security that mom wants to know about being able to be at home and the daughter wants to know um, about how mom's doing. Finally, linkages community. So this, this is built on a time bank. We didn't invent the, the idea, Edgar Kahn did decades ago, but a time bank. So like a bank, so a bank banks currency. So you deposit and somebody else can withdraw. You don't have to find the match. A time bank, you can deposit your time and somebody else can withdraw. So instead of depositing money, to deposit a time. An hour of your time is worth an hour of my time. It could be offering to garden for somebody or giving somebody a ride. And likewise, you can request things. So during the orientation, we teach people about this concept. And then we go through a mock exercise of, a, of an exchange. We first ask, well, post something you'd like to offer. And you get this pause, like, like what, what could I do that everybody would want? And somebody starts the conversation about what they do and sure enough, there's tons of things that you not only can do, but you want to do for somebody else. Same thing for the request. I don't need anything, but you don't necessarily need something to be done for you because you can't, but you would love to have to learn something new. And invariably, during that mock exercise, this happens. I don't know whether she got the request or, the, or submit the offer. And the point is, it's a validation of yourself. It's going back to meaning. It's feeling validate, validated and still a contribu contributor to society. So we built software to make that happen more efficiently. So you can give, learn, and share. 
So what's happening? How do we implement it? This also um, mirrors what Mayo's doing. We did it through activating communities, people who were already there. So we started um, in a city, Mountain View, which we picked for its social and, and economic diversity, and first went to things like that are run by the city, the libraries, the, the senior center, and made ourselves available, had orientation meetings at those locations. The next thing we went to was the private sector. So just like Mayo, we started out in a coffee house, which they, gave, they put up one of our posters, they gave us the key and said, hold meetings even when they weren't in business. So we would hold meetings just to have people um, be able to talk about this idea. And then finally, we went to our clinics so people could prescribe a referral to linkages, as an example. We brought it into the healthcare setting. So what's happened? Well, first of all, as we had hoped, it is multi-generational. So it's a third, 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 a third over 65, a third in the 50 to 64, sort of the caregiving age, and a third younger. And basically, half of the trend, half of the exchanges are done with someone over 65, but the majority are done with somebody younger. So it's very cross-generational. I can have plenty of stories to tell you about the richness of the exchanges that go on. And fortunately, when we ask them about satisfaction, um, the purple being strongly agree and the green uh, agree, so 95% got what they wanted for the exchange, satisfied the experience, and the net promoter score um, would recommend to friends and family. What do they do? Well, the most common thing is in this 33%, classes, lessons, or tutoring, which I'd consider enrichment. So yes, there were some rides exchanged and maybe gardening or teaching cooking, but a lot of it was basically enrichment. Now, we all know about the typical social services presented for anybody in the community and seniors, particularly housing, nutrition, transportation, and they have their networks and, and the people they serve in the community. But what happens is they come in, so Meals on Wheels is one of those um, services. They, multiple of these community services came to us and said, you know what, we can deliver a meal, but what these folks need are companionship, our social uh, connectedness. So what they wanted was to us, for us to partner with them in delivering and essentially completing their services. So the meals or the transportation or the job um, 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 counseling were just part of what people needed. So if you take these networks and tie them together in a social fabric, that would answer the true need for the whole person. So there's a, a time bank, large time bank in New York City, and they did surveys amongst their users. And 90% were very happy, and they increased the number of friends. Um, uh, almost a half had multiple contacts with these new friends a week. They felt like they, could, they belonged to the community and could, be, could stay in their homes longer, the whole age and community. But a, a startling piece is the next answer, which is, one of the most predictive questions you can ask somebody in terms of predicting your longevity, your, your, your mortality, and your mobility, as well as utilization, is how's your health? That one question. Poor, fair, good, very good, excellent, that will predict your mortality, morbidity, and utilization of healthcare services. Half the folks who join the time bank raise their category of their self-perceived health. What does that mean? When you switch from one category to another, you are reducing your hospitalization rate by 30% and reducing your high out frequency outpatient um, utilization by 30%. That's real value in terms of to the individual, and that's real value in terms of missed cost um, to society. So if you take a look at this, go back to the things that affect the outcome that matters to an individual, if we do, if we were to consider the whole thing, that's a lot of data. The good news is there's a lot of data now that is out there, um, whether it's the wearables or things in the home, there's lots of data out there. The bad news is for the poor human doc is how do I deal with all of that in a meaningful way? So that's, now here's the transition over to what, what Watson Health can bring, and that's why I've moved over to see if I can systematize considering the whole person into the practice of medicine, the fabric of medicine. So what is Watson? Some of you know about the program, you know, the game show Jeopardy. So in 2011, they pitted the, the world champs in Jeopardy. That's where you, you um, pick a, 
say what question has that answer. And they were, post, they were playing against um, a computer, Watson. So it turns out, so one of the things it did is they, Watson would rank the score. Here's proposed answers that Watson would have, and they would rank list um, by probability of that answering the question. And that was one of the ways of exposing how does Watson think about the problem. Well, it turns out that Watson did win by quite a bit against the two um, uh, best humans <laughs> at the game. So taking that technology then and with the data, whether it's all the image da data we have or the genomics or the data from the EHR or data, data from social media, if you combine all that, what we want to do is see can you bring s the benefit of all that data about an individual to the individual. So it's a bit paradoxical, but you want to bring the benefit of all the data from hundreds of millions of people so you can treat the one person. Because each of us are not unique, um, clinically speaking. We, if you just look at, if you consider all the other people that have gone through similar situations, maybe similar treatments, you would love to have the benefit of that experience applied to this individual. Because any one doc has only seen thousands of patients. You'd love to have the benefit of everybody anonymously applied to the experience of an individual. So if you could consider not only the clinical, but also the social determinants, the social connection, the behavioral genomics, and all the people like that individual, we together in shared decision making could do a much better job saying, what are the options and why would these potentially apply to you, a person in front of you? So how does, why does this work? And it's going to emphasize the themes that were just raised. There's a woman named Jennifer Ocker, who's a biz school um, professor at Stanford, who writes about happiness. And the three components that she thinks most contribute to our, our happiness are these. Meaning, connectedness, and being a part of something bigger. And you've heard that theme over and over again. Um, that's what makes us human. And I think as you grow older, especially as, as you um, retire, it becomes even more impactful. So to summarize, aging is a grand challenge. That's what this whole conference has talked about. And it's something that I don't know that doing more of the same or even doing what we do better is the answer, but it's more, and, and right now, for, for America at least, I can speak with, it's an epidemic for us, loneliness is. We're going to have to think very different about how we approach the problem. And again, it goes from everything from the, the, the sidewalk we walk on, through the food, through the ecosystem, to including health care delivery. But that if we tied it all together, and importantly, if we considered the whole individual and the supporting cast, meaning our communities, I think we have a fighting chance. That if we take this tool, we can actually add all of those dimensions to an individual and bring them to bear when we're trying to decide on how to help an individual. For that, I want to thank you for your attention and, consider, and, and, and advocate for considering the whole person and the whole community as we approach aging. Thank you very much. Mr. Tang, uh, maybe a last question. We're um, about to end this, uh, this um, conference for this afternoon. Um, it's, it's quite interesting because you both addressed, Mr. Alkemada, and you, the same problem, and we heard it this afternoon before already, but same problem, loneliness as a, as a sort of, uh, as an obstacle for mm -hmm. healthy aging. Um, uh, Mr. Alkemada uh, made a uh, Planned for for um, let's say the, the the urbanistic point of view. How can we integrate elderly people in a society with good uh, um, uh, healthcare uh, in their uh, environment? And you're pleading for let's say a virtual relation, uh, a, a virtual program, um, a, a time bank where people can connect together and and use their uh, their, their their community as mm -hmm. a source of. Health. How, how, how would you react on Mr. Alkemada and, is, 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 uh, and the urbanistic approach? Okay, I'm gonna, first of all, I'm going to clarify. Um, I wasn't advocating for a virtual connection. Mm -hmm. We are using the computer to find each other, or discover each other, but I think our ideas are very in tune. So we don't want to just have a bunch of old people, a bunch of young people. We want to integrate our life experiences. We call it rebuilding community. So. At least in our modern, you know, in our modern society where everything's done online and, and you don't really have as much eye contact with people, 
we're going to take advantage of that to connect people, but actually it's the human interaction that's causing the treatment of loneliness in a sense. So I think our, our ideas are very much aligned. We need more social, healthy social interactions, not just the screen kind of time. And um, so to the extent that the architecture can reinforce that, the urban planning can reinforce that through parks, for example, um, and then we just want to apply a little technology to help make the connection, the discovery. Okay, thank you. Mr. Alcamado, would you maybe please have a last comment on the, on the lecture of um, Mr. Tang? <laughs> I think this is uh, a great way of using all the new media in a way to, to make these connections. Because eh? indeed, uh, they have problems, but they have also enormous potential to connect. Eh? And it's uh, the way you use them that in the end will make uh, the difference. And this kind of connections indeed is leading to real contact. Eh? And that is in the, in the end what you need. Eh? And I think uh, we need to address uh, the issue of loneliness uh, on many different fields. And the more these domains cross over, the better the results uh, will be. Well, um, is there maybe a last question in the audience? If no, then we are going to close this <laughs> conference. <laughs> or did I miss someone? Yes, sorry. <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, wait a moment. I will make sure. How do you protect the privacy of people when they're all connecting? I warned Mr. Tang that this, yeah. is, a, this is an issue in Holland. So, so one is um, I'm extremely I'm a um, privacy advocate, so I've actually testified in Congress on the matter of privacy. Two, all of these things are voluntary. So an individual, um, just like any other social media, decides they want to sign up for it and then post whatever it is they want to post. So everything's done um, uh, um, at, at their discretion. What we try to do is, and if they consent to, if they want us to share any information with their physician, then we will. But uh, without their consent, we won't do that. As I showed you with that email, it turns out that can influence how um, your physician or your healthcare team interacts with you. So, but it's all completely voluntary and all the other information is protected. Thank you very much. Thank you.